once was dead in sin, alone and hopeless. The child of wrath I walked, condemned in darkness. But your mercy, but your mercy brought me life, and in your loving kindness, raised me up with Christ. So when I am heartless, if ever I forget my true identity, show me who I am. My sin has been to Emmanuel. We're so excited you guys are here with us this morning. Uh, this next song we introduced last week, and we really want to make it our prayer over this series that we center our lives around God. I want to invite you to sing it with us.
teach my heart. And teach my heart with all your wisdom to live for heaven. Teach my heart, oh my God, forever you reign here and now. Hear the sounds of your. together.
thank you so much for sending your son to die for us, Lord. We can be brave when times get tough, when times get hard, God, because we know that we have a savior. God, please open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say through Danny today. God, help us to draw closer to you and to make you the center of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Emmanuel. My name is Matt, and uh, Danny's going to come up in just a little bit for week two of our series, Closer Than Ever. Uh, But before he comes up, I just want to share a few things with you. First of all, if you're a guest with us here today, uh, we just want to make sure that you feel welcome. Hopefully, um, if you have written off church before as irrelevant or boring or not for you, hopefully we beat your expectations already, and my hope is is that uh, the rest of this morning will continue to do that. There's uh, something we call the connection card that's right in front of you. If you're a first-time guest, I want to point you there. Uh, That connection card allows us to get to know you a little bit. It also allows us to uh, tell you a little bit about who we are as a church. And so if it's your first time here today, if you'll fill that card out, uh, and on your way out today, just out into the right of the auditorium is our information desk. We've got an awesome team of volunteers there that if you put one of these in their hand, and if it's your first time, they'll just hand you a gift to say thanks for sharing some of your Sunday morning with us here at Emmanuel. You can also fill that card out and drop it in the offering bucket as it goes by uh, here in just a few minutes if you're more comfortable doing that as well. Hey, moms, I've got an announcement just for you. I'm a little sad to say this because I'm a dad and I don't get to do this, uh, but on February 11th is our next mother-son adventure, and it's going to be held at Perfect North Slopes in southern Indiana for a day of tubing. That sounds fun, doesn't it, dads? But if you've got a K through 12th grade uh, son, moms, uh, we want to make sure that you know you're invited to that and you can register. Uh, there's more information on, uh, on the Emmanuel app, but also in your handout today. But there's a couple things that I want you to know about this event that are pretty special. First of all, if you register before January 28th, you'll get the best price registration. Uh, that helps us plan a little better. So make sure you get in there, you late bloomers. Uh, and secondly, here's what's fun. If you register for the event, and let's say you have a friend at, at work or uh, maybe a classmate Uh, of your kids in school. If that friend is not connected with us uh, uh, at Emmanuel or part of a church, you can invite that friend and their son for free just by registering for the event. And so we want to encourage you to do that, to reach out and invite fellow moms and sons along at the uh, mother-son adventure uh, along the way. We're going to be registering for that through the My EC Life portal. Many of you have received an email and plugged into that already. So we encourage you to register for the event on the portal. If you've had uh, issues with that or you have questions about that, uh, we've got an awesome team out here at the registration desk, also out and to the right of the auditorium on your way out today that can help answer those questions for you and get registered if you need to for that. With that, I'll hand it to Danny. He's got a special announcement. Thanks, Matt. What's up, guys? How are you feeling today? Pretty good? Awesome. Awesome. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Uh, hey, a qu- couple of quick thoughts. Uh, if you remember back in 2016, a couple months ago, uh, no, a couple weeks ago, uh, we did a series called Generosity in the month of November, and I challenged you guys to, to become a little bit more generous in, your, in, your fi- in the area of finances. And what we said in that series is that it's actually a blessing for you. Jesus said, the more that you receive, you're blessed. No, he didn't say that. He said, he said, the more that you give, you're going to be blessed for that. We said, the more you give, the more you live. And guess what? You guys responded. Since that series, our offerings have gone up 27%. I want to say awesome job. Let's give God glory for that. What that means, here's it, all that means is that we're going to be able to do more ministry. We have a multi-site vision here in the United States, and this so far we're just in the state of Indiana. Maybe we'll, one day we'll go beyond that. But we're also in places all across the world. We're in places like Haiti and Africa and Nicaragua. And so we are making a difference, not just here, but, but all across the globe. So I want to say thank you for that. If your generosity continues, here's what we've been saying. We will expand our ministry at the rate of your generosity, which simply means we're going to touch more lives with uh, with more income and so thank you for that and also one more thing today today I know of you I know many of you like to wait to the last minute uh, to sign up for stuff because we do too uh, so today is the last day that you can ba- uh, to register to be baptized if you look in your hand out there January 15th uh, today's the last day who should be baptized? Well, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you intend on following him and trying to obey him and honor him with your life, not that you're going to get it perfect because who gets it perfect? Anybody? 
Anybody perfect in the room? Okay, nobody's perfect. We're never going to get it perfect. That's what grace is all about. But if you intend on following him and obeying him, guess what? Baptism is probably your next step. And so we would like you to go to our website, eclife.org. There's a little video on there that I've made for you. Watch that video, and then you can follow the links to register for that. Um, If you're scared to death to be baptized, anybody? (laughs) Okay, because you got to get up here and get dunked in water, and it could be a little scary. Remember this. Every time we do a baptism service, I'm telling you, every time, friends, family members, co-workers come to watch you get baptized, and then guess what? They get to hear the presentation of the greatest message in the entire world, the message that Jesus Christ died for them, that they too can be forgiven of their sins, because baptism is just a, it's a silent sermon. When you get baptized, you're going under the water. That's a symbol of you dying to your old nature. And when you come up, you're being washed symbolically by the water into newness of life, forgiven and redeemed by Christ. Well, when you do that, I get to present the message and then people put their faith in Christ and everybody lives happily ever after. Isn't that fun? So think beyond yourself. Don't just think about yourself when it comes to baptism. Your baptism, the reason we do it in front of people, the reason it's public and not in your bathtub. Some people actually ask me, can you come to my house and baptize me in my pool? And I say no, because that's a private affair. It's a public affair because it's a testimony to those who need to hear the message. So like that little short sermon there? That's just supposed to be an announcement. All right, so I'm done. So make sure you uh, you get registered for that. And now we're going to receive our offering. Guess what? Guess what? cool fact, over 60% of our income as a church now is done online, okay, that's pretty, that's pretty cool, okay, some of you are like, okay, what's that mean, well, what that means is that when you see someone not put anything in the bucket when it's about to pass, that means that they probably give online, so you can actually say to the person next to you, uh, I give online, <laughs> <laughs> and then you won't feel like you're a cheapskate or something like that, so, okay, okay, now we're ready to pray, here we go, Jesus, we love you, thank you that we get to have fun, in church and talk about you and draw close to you. And I just pray that you'd be honored uh, as we give back a small portion of our income to you to make a difference in this world. Uh, It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we started a series last week called Closer Than Ever, and if you weren't here last week and you didn't catch the podcast, uh, to catch you up to speed very, very quickly, we began with a question. I love questions because they stir your heart. A good question can really stir your heart and really change the direction of your life. We started with this question, how close do you feel to God? On a scale of 1 to 10, how close do you feel to God? Like, A one would be, man, I'm so far from God, I don't even think he knows my name. I haven't touched the Bible in years. You're lucky I'm sitting in church today. I don't talk to him. He didn't talk to me. Very distant. That would be like a one. Uh, A ten would be like, man, we are tight. We're best buds. We text. We call. We email each other. Like, we're, we're we're just in. Like, he's my buddy. He's my friend. And I feel his presence. And he gives me direction. And he's talking to me all day long. That would be like a ten. So on a scale of one to ten, where are you? I wanted you to grade yourself give yourself a five, a six, or a or seven, or a two, and all we wanted to do in this series is move you from like wherever you are, whether it's a three or a five, maybe a couple of numbers up, or maybe three or four numbers up from a two to a seven, or from a four to an eight, or something like that, so that you can be closer to God, because what we said last week is that it's possible, and it's probably the right thing that, that all of us should be and can be closer to God, yes or no? Like, there's room for us to grow, and many of us are not where we need to be with God because it's easy to drift, isn't it? It's easy to kind of let your relationship with God grow stagnant, get stale, and grow cold. You know, you change jobs, or you have 
some children or life gets busy and you get around the wrong people who don't care about church. They like the party scene. They like to go out. They like to do different things. And all of a sudden you find yourself far from God. Isn't that true? And what we said in the series is that don't give up because God is not far. He's right there. He's not way off in the distance. In fact, if you were to turn to him today, Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right there. Paul said he's not far from any one of us. So really all we want to do in this series is help you, give you some principles to draw closer to God than you ever have walked with him before. This series is a little bit different in the sense that we're going to go kind of through one passage of scripture, the book of Psalms, uh, verse uh, chapter 34. We're going to kind of work through that. Why? Because it's both descriptive It describes what a person looks like who's close to God, and it's also prescriptive. It tells us what to do, and so I like, I I really like that psalm, and another thing we're going to do that's a little different is the 21-day fast, the 21-day fast, and if you're new with us here today, you're like, what's that? Well, fasting is just basically this idea uh, when you deny your body some type of uh, element. Some, most of the time it's food, but it could be television, it could be social media, it could be something else. You deny yourself something for a period of time for a specific spiritual purpose. And the purpose of, of our fast uh, over the next uh, 14 days or so, because we're seven days in, uh, is to draw closer to God. And so I presented some options to you. Uh, there was the food fast. We started out with like the really intense total 21 day, no food, no solid food, just juice, water, coffee, whatever. And then we talked about no junk food. And then we talked about maybe the Daniel fast, which was fruits and vegetables. How many of you chose the no junk food just by show of hands? All right, all right. Did you kill anybody yet? You okay? (laughs) You didn't snap? Did you snap yet? Okay. That's tough to give up sugar. Way to go. Way to go. Um, How many of you chose the Daniel fast, just fruits and vegetables? Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, How many of you chose to do the total no solid food for 21 days? Anybody crazy enough to try that? Okay, a couple of hands. Great job, great job. Um, And so then we said if you didn't want to mess with food, you could do television, you could do no no uh, social media, or you could do no uh, video games. How many of you chose no social media? You've been off. Wow, are you okay? You all right? We need some counseling? Okay, because we can help you after the service. I know it's tough, it's tough. All right, so the reason, again, why would we do that sounds crazy. The, the only, fasting is a catalyst for your spiritual growth. In fact, I mentioned last week that we would have this book, and this book is available for you today if you'd like to grab a copy. A copy. Uh, it's called Awakening, 21 Days to Revolutionize Your Relationship with God. Uh, I just finished it yesterday, and uh, it's a short book, 12 chapters. And so I wanted to read to you something that jumped out to me. This is fantastic. The author is a pastor in Florida. He said, fasting awakens your hunger for God. Fasting awakens your hunger for God. When you shut down your natural appetites, your spiritual appetites wake up. He says, you are, pas- you are more passionate for God, and your desire for God becomes greater than your desire for other things. And I've noticed that over the last seven days, as I've shut down my physical appetite for food, my spiritual desires have, have woken up, and I'm wanting God more and more and more. And that's what fasting does. It's just a mechanism. It's a catalyst. It's a tool to draw you closer to God. So let's jump into our, 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 our talk today. We're going to continue to talk about how do we draw closer to God. If you're going to be closer to God than ever, you're going to have to seek Him. You're going to have to seek after God. The other day I lost my cell phone. Ever happened to you? And it happens more often than I'd like to admit. And it was at this particular moment where the car was running at 6.50 in the morning. I've got to get my son to school and everybody's got bags and clothes and jackets and gloves and all these different things. And we're on our way out and I realized I don't have my phone. I realized I don't know where it is. So what do I do? I call an all-out search. And I'm talking about searching every hot spot in the house where you might put your cell phone, right? Why isn't there one spot? And some of you have figured that out, right? You're smart. I'm not that smart. Uh, so, so I'm like, where is it? Where is it going? I've got my wife calling it. Of course, it's on vibrate, so, you know, you can't hear it. And I've got the kids involved. And there's an all-out search in my house for my cell phone. Why? Isn't it because this thing is extremely valuable? Isn't that the reason? In fact, for me, it's not just my cell phone, it's also my wallet. So I've got cash in there, I've got my ID, can't drive without this, I've got my credit card in there, my debit card in there, I've got my, my insurance card in there, if I, you know, when you take it to the doctor or whatever, it's my wallet, cash, all that stuff. So there's an all-out search because this is incredibly valuable to me. And something struck me 
when I was doing that search, after I was over, because I looked for it until what? Until what? Until I found it. Of course I did, right? Because you have to have it, right? And so something struck me. I said, you know, sometimes I don't search for things with that type of intensity, like when I lose a pair of shoes. And then, you, you know, I can't find them. It's like, well, I'll look for them later because I have multiple pairs. <laughs> Unless they're your favorite shoes, am I right? And then the intensity of the search goes up. Or how about when you lose, you know, a shirt or something, you're like, ah, where is it? Yeah, I don't know. You don't, like, you don't call, you don't get the whole family involved, look for the shirt, unless it's that one that makes you look skinny, you know. <laughs> and then, you, then the search, then the intensity of the search goes up, right? This, this is the truth that struck me. It's in your notes there. Isn't this true? The intensity of the search depends on the value of the object that has been misplaced. Isn't that true? Like there's some things you just won't search that intensely for because they're not that important. But when it's really important, you go on an all-out search. You get all your, your, your strategies out and you get as many people involved as you can because it must be found. Now it's through that lens, it's through that context that I want you to hear this verse. Jeremiah 29. God says this through the prophet Jeremiah. You will seek me and you will find me and that's the purpose of our lives, is to find God. You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with how much of your heart? Half? Three quarters? One quarter? 85%? How much of your heart? Oh. When, when the search is all out, when you, when you pull out every strategy, when you go at this thing with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, that's when you find me. You say, did Jesus talk about that, seeking this, seeking me? You bet he did. Matthew 6, this is some of your life verse. This is, for some of you, this is your life verse. He said, I want you to seek, say it with me, first. Not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth, not tenth. The first priority in your life when you get out of bed is to seek first the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's the place where God lives. It's the place where God's active. It's the place where God is doing things. It's God himself. He says, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness, all my right ways, all the ways that I do things. I want you to find my paths for living when it comes to relationships and money and sexuality. I want you to figure out my path for your life in all the different areas. Seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness. And then guess what I'll do? This, this, I love God. I just love it. He says, and when you do that, when you get, the things, uh, when you get things prioritized correctly, I'll take care of everything else. I know you need a home to live in. I know you need some relationships because you're a relational being. I know you need some money and some cash to live on. I know you need some food and some clothing. I know you need some wisdom when it comes to parenting. Anybody? (laughs) I know, I know, I know you need all that stuff. But here's what I want you to do. Make me the top priority in your life and I will fill in all the gaps. Can I ask you a tough question today? Can I ask you a question that's just going to bother you? You might not even come back next week. You get mad at me. What are you really seeking in your life? Like what's really behind it all? Where, what are you really looking for? Some of you, if, if you're honest, you'd say, I really want a husband. I'm lonely. Some of you, if you're really honest, you say, I really want to get rid of my husband. <laughs> <laughs> we tell the truth in church, we do. No point lying, he sees it all, right? What are you seeking? Security through financial gain, through, through accumulation of financial money, financial wealth, a bigger possessions, bigger cars, nicer homes. Like what, like, what are you really seeking? I mean, the thing that, that's in your heart that nobody really knows or talks about. To be more attractive, more physically attractive. This is a big one for me, just confession time. Oftentimes I find myself, instead of seeking first the kingdom of God, I seek first the success of my children. It's called idolatry. God's been dealing with my heart. I put that above him sometimes. The success of my children. It's a tough one. This is why this question bothers me. Because it gets to the core of my soul. All the hidden motives that no one else can see. What are you really seeking? See, here's the truth today I want you to hear. 
If you're seeking, if I'm seeking something more than I'm seeking God, I will never be as close to God as I can be. And neither will you. If there's something else that you value more than God, that you're seeking more than God, you will never be as close to God as you can be. Because the prophet, Jeremiah, he said, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart, when I'm your treasure. One time Jesus was trying to explain this concept, blows my mind, Matthew chapter 33, Matthew chapter 13, verse, verse 44. Jesus said this, here's what, the, here's what the kingdom's like. It's like when a man stumbles upon a treasure in a field and, and, and he, all of a sudden he hides it, he covers it up. He's like, whoa, uh, th- this thing is so valuable, I've got to cover it. Why does he cover it up? Because he doesn't want anybody else to find it. And then in his joy, in his excitement, in his happiness, he goes back to his house, he sells everything he has, and he gets the cash, he puts everything on eBay, <laughs> gets the money, comes back, and what does he do with the field? He buys the field. Why does he buy the field? Because of the treasure that's in it. What is Jesus saying? Jesus isn't saying, leave here today and go put all your stuff on eBay. That'd be crazy, okay? Not going back to that church. <laughs> Jesus is not saying that. He's just saying, I am so incredibly valuable that it's, I'm worth you selling everything you have so that you could get me. My ways, my kingdom, my person. <sighs> what are we really dealing with here when we deal with Jesus? Perhaps we're dealing with the most precious possession in the universe. Perhaps. See, I believe we're not close to God or we're not as close to God as we should be because we don't understand who we're dealing with. We don't understand what we're dealing with when we talk about Jesus and the kingdom of God. And if we could understand the value of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, we would go on an all-out search, wouldn't we? Because the, the intensity of the search, it depends on the value of the object. And if we valued God as supreme in our life, what would we do every single day before we left the house? Talk to me. What would we do? We'd call the kids in. Get in here. We're finding God. <laughs> We'd get our wife in the room, our husband in the, in the room. we got to find God because he is most important in our life. And I'm not leaving the house until I find him. Whew. Wow. So what David's going to do in Psalm 34, you know what he's going to do? He's going to help us understand the value of God because he's sought after God. There is incredible value to God. Two things David's going to show us. Number one, let's talk, let's talk about it. He's going to show us that when you seek God, you're going to experience deliverance. You're going to experience deliverance. Deliverance is a great Bible word. It's a synonym for salvation. We talk about being saved as Christians. What does that mean? That means you're delivered from the power and the penalty of sin. You've been literally rescued out of the trap of sin and death. That's salvation, right? It it means deliverance. I remember when I was a little kid, uh, probably in the sixth grade, there was this bully in the seventh grade. You, anybody else have a bully in their life? This kid would literally do the typical bullying. He would come over to me and he'd punch me, take my money. He would. He would take my money. I'd have to pay him to stop hitting me. So I was a skinny little kid. I mean, really skinny, like <laughs> pathetically skinny. And it hurt. So I went home one day and I told my dad around the dinner, t- dinner table, I said, you know, there's this kid at school. He punches me. He takes my money. I kid you not. <laughs> my dad looked at my brother who was tough and thick. He was one of those seventh graders that had a mustache. I didn't get those jeans, okay? (laughs) My dad looked at my brother, and he said, tomorrow, I want you to beat the crap out of that kid. (laughs) And I thought at the dinner table, what have I done? (laughs) This is a totally true story. One day you'll meet my brother. It's unbelievable. He'll tell it better than I can. But he, he he came to my lunch period the next day on my father's directions sat next to this kid, and I said, what are you going to do? He said, when the bell rings, I'm going to beat the crap out of him. <laughs> so I'm like, I've, I've never seen this before. I'm, I'm a sixth grader, you know? The bell rings. My brother jumps on this kid, and this kid was a big kid. He was like le- one of those left-back kids, you know what I'm talking about? They, never, they just leave him back, so he's all developed and all that stuff. He, he jumps on this kid, grabs him in the headlock, and starts going, boom, boom, boom. Like three or four shots right to the nose. I'm watching it like, whoa. <laughs> Not, no joke, no joke. The kid's nose splits open and blood starts gushing everywhere. I mean, down his shirt. He's got him on the table. He's got him on the ground. He won't let go of his neck. He keeps hitting, he keeps hitting him. 
You know, I honestly, this, this kid was a bully. And, and so the principal there was there. He kind of watched. <laughs> he let it go. Instead of my brother getting expelled, he sent him back to class. It's unbelievable. True story. Guess what happened that day? I was delivered. <laughs> I mean, that's what this word means. And I never picked a fight with my brother again. <laughs> never. Deliverance. David sought God because God was the God who delivered it. Listen to verse 4. Watch this. David says in verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he what? What did he do? Delivered me from all my fears. He delivered me from all my fears. See, God delivered David from four particular things. The first one was fear. And I know you have fear, and I know how I have fear. Fear of the future, fear of what's going to happen. Someone's been diagnosed. Someone's got uh, a, a found, they found a lump in, 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 in the chest or something like that. Or I, I know life is filled with all kinds of bad news, and there's all kinds of fear that go along. With fear about the future, fear about the, 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 the political situation in our country today. I mean, there's, you could be afraid of everything today. David says, you want to know why I seek God? Because he delivers me from my fears. Very practical. Listen to what he says in verse 15. This is a theological statement. Same Psalm, verse 15. Watch this. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are toward their cry. I love this verse because it basically David is revealing his theology about how God relates to us. He's looking down at us. And his ears are, he's going like this, his ears are toward our cry. In other words, he wants to deliver us when we cry out to him. Why does David seek after God? David seeks after God for very practical reasons, for deliverance from fear. But it's not just fear, it's also shame. Deliverance from shame. And, and we don't talk about shame a lot in church, but, but we should, and we're probably going to talk more about it. Brene Brown says that shame is, can be defined this way. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love or belonging. It's this idea that because of what has happened to me or because of what I've done in the past, I'm flawed, I'm damaged goods, and I'm not worthy of anyone's love or, or, or to belong to anybody. People can feel shame about almost anything. They can feel shame about the family they came from, mistakes that they've made in the past. You can feel shame about a divorce. You can feel shame about a DUI, a bankruptcy. People can feel shame about their physical appearance. You name it, people are feeling shame. It's this, it's this very real pain that comes from something that's happened to us. Maybe you've been sexually abused in the past or something happened. Maybe you were the sexual abuser in the past. Things that you've done, it's like, oh, and you hang your head in shame. Listen to David in verse 5. Those who look, there's the seeking right there. Those who seek God, those who look to him, they're radiant. Their faces are shining. They're bright. Their heads are up. Watch this. And their faces shall never be, say it with me, ashamed. The word means to be humiliated. There will be no more humiliation when you seek God. David is saying, the reason I seek God is very practical, because he delivers me from all of my shame. How's that work as a Christ follower? Well, if you know the Bible, when you seek after God and you find Christ, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes? Have you read that? It says in Psalm 103 that as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions or our sins from us. In the Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, it says, though your sins were like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Anybody excited about that? When we come to Christ, he delivers us from all of the shame. He wipes it away. He gives us a clean slate, a down do-over, a fresh start. And he says, don't you dare hang your head because you're my daughter, you're my son. And I have forgiven you and I have cleansed you. That's powerful. That'll change your life. Why do I seek God? Why did David seek God? Because he delivers us from all of our shame. But it's not just our shame, it's also our trouble. Have you ever noticed that life is filled with trouble? Trouble here, trouble there, trouble everywhere. Have you noticed that? Trouble in your body, trouble in a marriage, trouble in a, a financial situation, trouble at work, trouble, you know, in a conflict. I mean, there's trouble everywhere. I was listening at Starbucks the other day, I was with a friend of mine, and, and, uh, and I overheard a conversation, and the girl simply said, why is life so hard? And I, th I wanted to say, amen, <laughs> it's hard, it's filled with trouble. Listen to David in verse 6, this poor man cried, this, this man who's, who's empty, I've got nothing, he comes to God humbly, and he says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and did what? 
saved him. That's the word, deliver. Saved him how, out of how many troubles? All of his troubles. David sought God for very practical reasons because God delivered him from his troubles. Did he have troubles? Yeah, he was on the run for his life. Saul was trying to kill him, chase him down, hunt him like a dog. He was afraid for his life. And God kept delivering David out of Saul's hand every single time. Wow. Charles Spurgeon was a preacher back in 1885, 1855 or so. And I, I have his commentaries on, the, on the, all of the Psalms. They're called The Treasury of David. Fantastic series, a set of three books. He said this about verse 6. Prayer, when we cry out to God, can clear us of troubles as easily as the Lord made riddance of the frogs and the flies of Egypt when Moses cried out to God. If you know your Bible, what's he talking about? What episode in Exodus? He's talking about what? He's talking about the Exodus, when the plagues came down. And, and, and then Pharaoh would say, okay, uncle, I give. And then Moses would cry out to God, and whatever plague was there, God would remove it. Do you have some flies? Do you have some frogs in your life? Yes or no? That need to go? The Bible simply says, when you cry out to God, he will deliver you from all of your troubles. Look at verse 17. I love it. This is, again, this is David's theology. Watch this. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. Now, I know that doesn't work every time. And I know it's not immediate sometimes. Sometimes the trouble doesn't go away. You say, I know you like to argue with the preacher because I do it too. So you might be thinking, well, I've tried that before. I've asked God to remove this trouble from my life. And it hasn't worked. Can I just say that your time is not God's time? That the trouble remains there for a purpose. There's something he's trying to teach you. There's something he's trying to change in you. He's trying to use the trouble to get into your soul and rearrange things in your life. But when the time is right, it's still true. When the righteous cry out to God, he delivers them from all of their troubles. When I was with my friend at Starbucks the other day, he, he didn't know what my sermon was going to be about. He started telling me, he said, Danny, you're not going to believe this. But you know about the relationship I was in, and I kind of knew what, what was going on. It was, a, it was a bad relationship he was in with his girlfriend, and things went south pretty quickly. And he said, you know, I just want out. I just want to get away. I just want to detach myself. But they were intertwined and, and, in different ways, and it was kind of a complicated situation. Isn't that how life goes sometimes? And he said, but you're not going to believe this. I prayed that God would set me free, or I can't believe if I used that phrase or not, but that it would be over. And the next day she called me and she said, I want nothing to do with you anymore. <laughs> and you could just see the joy in his face that he got away. <laughs> he got away from the crazy woman. Now, I know that story. Listen, I know that story flip-flops, and some of you have gotten away from the crazy dude, the controlling maniac man. You know, it's like, God, get me away from this guy. It's not about guy or girl. It's just the fact that God delivered him. It was miraculous. She decided what nothing to do with you anymore. It's true. When the righteous cry out to God, he delivers them from all their troubles. But it's not just the troubles. It's also danger. Danger. Our world is filled with danger. Do you agree? Yeah, you can hardly turn the television on anymore without finding out, you know, some new school or, or college or, or mall has been shot up with somebody, some crazy people with, with automatic weapons, right? It's, like, it's nuts. It's dangerous. It's not a safe place to live in this world sometimes. Danger. David sought after God because God was his protection. Listen to verse 7. He says, the angel of the Lord encamps, squats down, surrounds, hovers over. That's what this word encamps mean. Around those who fear him. And what does he do? What does the angel do? Delivers him. The angel of the Lord. One angel. David knew that one angel could protect his life from danger. We have dangers in our life. We need, we need God's protection. There's a great story in 2 Kings. Every time I go through the Bible each year, every time I come to the story, I'm always amazed by it. I don't know why it catches me off guard, but it does. The story is simply this. In 2 Kings, there's this army, big army, the Assyrian army, a godless nation with a really powerful king named Sennacherib. That's a cool name, right? You should name your kid that, right? Get over here, Sennacherib. It's almost like a... It's almost like demeaning, you know, Sennacherib, you know, I don't know. Anyway, this, this king, Sennacherib, he's got this powerful army, and they're just marching through the whole region, just defeating nation after nation after nation. Well, guess who the next nation was? The nation of Israel. And their king at that particular time was Hezekiah. And so Hezekiah goes before the Lord and says, if you don't deliver us, we're toast. We're done, I'm paraphrasing. But basically, that's the prayer that he prays. 
Watch what happens in 2 Kings. This is unbelievable. The next day, watch what happens. That night, there's the angel that David was talking about in verse 7. The angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp, and, and he went to town on these guys. He killed 185. These were the bad guys, okay? These were the guys that were godless. They were mocking God. They wanted to destroy Israel, God's people. One angel destroyed 185,000 Man, look at the next verse. It says this. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere, and they got out of there. <laughs> they left town. We live in a, a world that's filled with danger. You know what? God's angel can protect us. See, David sought after God, not because God was a nice theoretical idea, but because God delivered him from all of these different things, his fear, his shame, his troubles, and danger. How about you? But it's not just deliverance, it's also satisfaction. Number two, you experience satisfaction. Satisfaction. I went to a Christmas party um, this last Christmas, and a friend of mine had ordered some steaks from Ruth Chris. And uh, he, he was cooking them on the back porch, and when he brought them in, he kept bringing them in. It was tray after tray after tray. It was unbelievable. He had cut up the steak in little pieces, with little toothpicks. And some of it was filet mignon, and some of it was New York strip, and some of it was all these different types of steak cuts. It was the best party I have ever been to. (laughs) Because it was just, every 10 minutes, amazing. See, some of you are vegans, and I don't understand that, but (laughs) you're probably going to live longer than the rest of us, so keep it up. But, but, um, But the taste of filet, it was so juicy. It was like melting in your, you ever, have you ever had that experience? And it, this is a hard example because I haven't eaten food in seven days. So this, I struggle right now. This is a tough one. My mouth's kind of watering right now as I remember. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Each bite, I mean, it was like some of them were rare, some of them were medium rare. It's beautiful, beautiful thing. Have you ever noticed that a person never does a study when it comes to sin? you notice that? They don't like do a book study or, you know, maybe I want to commit some adultery. Let me figure this out. <laughs> I'd like to get smashed out of my mind and shoot, shoot heroin in my veins. Let me, where are the books? Let's see if this is worth it. No, what do they do? They just go ahead and try it, right? Yes or no? They try it. They experiment. They have an experience. Sin is all about experience. Listen to verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. David understands that if we are going to be close to God, we have to experience God. We don't need to do a theological study to figure out, is this worth it? Should I really, should I really commit my life to God? David says, no, 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 no. You need to experience him. See, at that Christmas party, when I was eating that steak, here's what I said to my friend repeatedly. This is so good. It's so good. Listen. Taste and see that the Lord is he's good. Not because I taste something in my mouth or, or anything like that, or I smell something in my nose. No, but because I have, I have this spiritual appetite. And when I taste God with my faith, I find that he is good. He satisfies. There's satisfaction. David says, you want to know why I seek God? I seek him because he satisfies my soul. If you and I are ever going to walk close to God, we have to approach God that way. Not from a theological, I need to understand more. No, no, no. I think there's a place for that. But from a place of saying, God, I want to taste you. I want to know that you are good. Blessed are those who take refuge, who put their trust in you. Charles Spurgeon said this about how to taste God. Listen to this. Faith is the soul's taste. You say, how do I taste God? You put your faith in him. You trust him. Those who test the Lord by their faith, by their confidence, always find him to be what? Delicious. Good. And they become themselves blessed. The reason I'm a Christian today is because I tasted. I tasted. I didn't do a study on God. I didn't do a study of Hinduism and the Muslim faith and the Jewish faith, and all the different faiths. I didn't do a study on all the faiths and then decide Christianity makes the most sense. 
I didn't do that. You know what I did? I tasted. I opened up my soul and I said, God, if you're there, come in. If you're real, if you love me, I want to know you. And God invaded my soul. And here's what I felt. Here's what I tasted. I tasted joy. I tasted peace. I tasted meaning and purpose. And I thought, wow, that's good. I want more of that. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Why did David seek God? Why did he seek him? He sought him because God delivered him from fear, from shame, from troubles, from danger, and he also satisfied him in his soul in a way that nothing in this world ever could. My question to you today is this, and it's, I hope it bothers you. I hope it bothers you. Will you seek him? And really what I'm asking you is not, will you seek him? It's probably the wrong question. Will you value him enough to where you will go on an all-out search until you find him? Because the intensity of the search depends on the value of the object misplaced. My hope today was to raise, or my, my, my goal today was to raise the value of God in your eyes so that you would go home today and say, I need God. I need God more than anything else. And you would start to seek him and start to create times of silence and solitude and fasting and prayer and, and scripture memorization so that you would find him and be satisfied and delivered. I hope I did a decent job doing that today for you. Will you seek him? Will you value him? He is precious. Now, I've created a little song here. Okay, I didn't create a song. Uh, I asked our worship team to sing a song because I want you to respond. During this song, I want you to draw near to God. If you want to come down front here and kneel down and pray, there's nothing necessarily super spiritual about that, but if you want to dedicate your life to God if you, by, by a physical act, if you want to raise your hands, if you want to stand up during this last song, if you want to say, God, I want to seek you with my life, here, th that's why we've, we've put this song at the end because I want you to respond and I want you to seek him. And then when the song's over, I'll come back up and wrap us up. Stands firm through all my life. In my search.
remain standing with me for a moment. <clears throat> Jesus said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. The Bible says that we are to seek him, but then Jesus flips it over and says, I'm seeking you. Amazing. This truth overwhelms me. When I was 15, 16, 17 years old, I heard, I heard the message that God wanted me. Wait, 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 wait. Does he know what kind of person I am? How rude I am? Uh, how I'm, I'm a thief? And I'm, I'm obnoxious? And he wants me? Yeah. Jesus said, I want you. I came for you. I came to this earth to die on a cross, to wash away all that sin, to wash away all that shame, to make you a brand new person. And he did it because he loved us. He did it because he loves you. Perhaps today, when you say on a scale of 1 to 10, man, I'm a minus 2. I don't even know Jesus. Guess what? He, he's seeking you right now. You can begin a relationship with him by simply putting your trust and confidence in him. That he died for you on the cross. That he rose again the third day to wash away what separated you and him, sin. You say, well, how do, I, how do I step into that relationship? Well, you, you simply trust him. You put your faith in him. You put your confidence in him through prayer. You reach out to him. And you say something like this, dear Jesus, come into my life. Wash me, forgive me, cleanse me, make me your child. And in that very moment, you become his child, his son, his daughter. If you'd like to do that right now, I invite you to close your eyes and bow your head. You say, I've never prayed before. That's okay. 
You can take my words, make them your own prayer. Reach out to God. With what little faith you have, it doesn't take much. Say this to Jesus. Jesus, I trust you. I come to you without all the answers, but with a little bit of faith. I believe you died on the cross for me. And three days later, you rose again so that I could be with you. Wash me today. Cleanse me today. Restore me today. Pour your spirit into me today. Make me your child today. I place my confidence in you. And from this day forward, help me to live my life in a way that honors you. When I mess it up, give me grace. Give me strength to stand back up and keep going. Help me to seek you with my entire heart. For deliverance, yes, but also for satisfaction. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer very quickly, we would like to put a gift in your hands as a church, a a copy of the one-year New Testament. And here's why. It's so important that you understand why. Because God is a communicating God. He talks to us in many ways, but primarily he speaks to us through his word. And so we want you to have a copy of the Bible. It's broken down. This little New Testament is broken down into about five-minute readings. So you can get a little bit of God's Word in your mind before you go to work, before you go to school in the morning, whatever it is. I read these same passages every day. And as you read the Word of God over the long haul, what He begins to do is shape you and feed your spirit and mold you, show you what needs to change in your life, show you what His will is for your life. And so if you, if you pray to receive Christ today, please go grab one of these on the way out. This table's in the back to my right and to my left. Can we give God glory today for what he's done? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. The intensity intensity of the search depends on the value of the object that has been misplaced. Is God extraordinarily valuable to you? If he is, you will begin seeking him with all of your heart. And guess what? You will begin finding him. He will deliver you and he will satisfy you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit, for working in our hearts today through the music, through the spoken word. Thank you for for producing in our hearts the changes that need to be changed, for breaking down the hard soil, the coldness, the distance, and drawing us into yourself. Help us to seek you. Help us to find you because you are who we need in this life. I hope you were pleased today by what was said and what was sung. And uh, we just want to honor you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Next week, week number three, check out the app. for. I'm going to make a quick video to encourage you on your fast. Bring a friend next week. God bless you. We'll see you.